Here we go. We're live. Hey. Hi, everyone. It's Wolfo number 44. Um, yeah. Number Excited four. to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, we're here with our friend Megan Elizabeth Trainer. Hello, Hi. everyone. And I'm Garrett, and this is also Garrett, apparently. Garrett. <laughs> Kelly. Yeah. Why not? Uh, you should change your name to Jeremy Puma so people don't get confused. <laughs> You'll get really, really confused. <laughs> I know nothing about name confusion. <laughs> oh my oh. goodness, that's true. I didn't even think about that. This didn't this wasn't triggering, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. It sounds so. It didn't something just happen this week too? Like you, you got like kicked off for not be. I, yeah, I tried to leave Twitter and like join some of the other sites. Unfortunately, I'd been on Mastodon for years, but I tried to join some other social networks, and they're like, you know, I would like go through the login process, and like 15 minutes later, they're like, your account is suspended, you're banned for life, and I'm like, impersonation of a celebrity. Sorry, uh, it's, hor it's awful. <laughs> it's but you know what? Um, it, like it 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 giveth and it taketh away. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, it's a good way for me to like get in touch with the like middle school girl community that I want oh. to introduce to like STEM and witchcraft. Oh you know, yeah, well that's... To, like show up in my digital space and be like, can I have concert tickets? And I'm like, no, but let's talk about you know logic gates. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, that's amazing. So, yeah, we're we gonna talk about we're. I think we're gonna talk about some of that stuff tonight. Some yeah, yeah, digital totally. witchery. And I love behind you. You have this uh, blackboard that looks like oh yeah, a physics yeah. professor or something. You want to talk? Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, let's see what's going on here. Um, it might be hard to see, but what we have here is, so here is an Einstein Rosen bridge. Um, and you might remember that is like the design from the Hedgewitch portals project. Um, in the middle, those like what looks like phases of the moon are actually logic gates uh, expressed as Venn diagrams. This is abracadabra. Uh, there's an amplifier circuit there, but then there's also a key of Solomon sigil. And they look just about the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got some electrical signals. So that's like electromagnetism. Um, yeah. So they're just, you know, like algebra and witchcraft and stuff all sort of thrown together. Cause it's all, it all just kind of percolates up from, you know, people hanging out, you know, Newton and Kepler and those guys and like, you know, the women in the cottages at the end of the street, um, they were sort of all doing the same thing. And then they got bifurcated. Um, and so I'm sort of trying to bring them back together. Oh, I can't. This is so exciting. I can't wait for you. OK, so before we dive in, um, like really get into it, is there any housekeeping stuff you want to talk about, Jeremy or? Well, um, I did want to mention a couple of things. One is that um, Bex has not vanished into a portal uh, and been kidnapped by Faye. <laughs> she actually is still in this plane. Um, she's just unfortunately uh, got a little illness. So that is why uh, we have not had Bex around. So uh, if you are the... Um, you know, thinking good thoughts, uh, sacrificing a rooster to a Sclepius kind of person, then please do uh, on behalf of uh, Bex. But we hope to have her back very soon, um, but not next week, because next week is the day before uh, Thanksgiving, uh, which, of course, is problematic and a problematic holiday in many ways. We recognize that, but... Um, we are still not going to do WUFO that Wednesday. Uh, so the next one after this one will be November 30th. Uh, did I miss anything? No, but I do have a candle lit here for Bex and this picture she took that she sent me. Yes. Of, of the static cat. The static cat, yes. So she took Love this picture in a graveyard and this weird electrical cat showed up as a weird anomaly. Yeah. So... 
so we 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 will hopefully be back to uh east and west coast woofos on the 30th um yeah that's all i got i think uh do you have you we have a so this week we have a donation um a place to donate that we we ask people if they can um to like um you know do some good deeds for wufo um and so i'll put the link up here and it's actually from megan megan you suggested this do you want to talk about who we who people would be donating to if they go to this link go go directly there we don't get any of the money doesn't go through us um, so yeah, this is the Gary International Black Film Festival. Um, they're a film festival in Gary, Indiana, which is just outside of Chicago. Um, it's a film festival in its 12th year. It's run by volunteers in the Gary community. The director actually lives in Seattle, which is how I sort of um, heard about it. And they do an amazing job of, uh, you know, fostering um, black directors, cinema around the black di diasporic experience. Uh, Ava DuVarnay actually showed really early, I think maybe in the second or third year. So wow. that, you know, really, yeah, really building talent in the community, uh, telling black stories and supporting black community, uh, telling stories and, and just building community around that shared experience of cinema. So cool. That is awesome. Yeah. So yeah, wufo.watch slash donate. Um, if you are privileged enough to be able to send some money and support their way, then please do. Um, and also, you know, as always, share on social media. Um, I was going to say share on Twitter, but these days that's, <laughs> it might not I even know. be there tomorrow. <laughs> How's the code base? <laughs> <laughs> oh so, it's so bad right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting really excited about Mastodon though, and you're on there too, Megan. And I, I was like, it's so I don't know. It feels like to me right now, like the reminds me of the early days of blogging in early Twitter, even, and like mm -hmm. it just feels more. It feels really friendly, and that's my impression of it so far. Yeah, um, and like built in. It just feels like really nice. I don't know though, but do you have an impression? Have you thought of? Have you had any feelings about it or? Um, I, I just haven't spent that much time there. Um, I think what has happened over the years is I kept being uh, like a lot of us, like, you know, this space is maybe not great. Um, but I feel, I felt like every time I went there, it was like a party that hadn't gotten started yet. Mm. And, um, I think the big change for me this last week was like, there's, there's a couple of people, you know, like when Twitter goes, there's a few communities that I'm really going to feel like, oh, I don't really have that connection anywhere else. Totally. Um, and um, so like there's the the crypto enthusiasts of Denmark. That's how I'm connected to them. It's like through Twitter and I'm trying to figure out where they're going. But they're much more like, you know, they're all using aliases and things. But a lot of folks that I've worked with in conferences in Europe and stuff seem to have made the jump. And so there's this like art academic space on Mastodon that seems to have a core energy where like, okay, and now this is where we'll talk about these ideas or these books or whatever. And so I'm like, okay, it's happening. And I think that there's just going to need to be a moment where like when Twitter actually like starts to crumble and then I think everyone will be there, but it, Twitter's still working. It's, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But I think I think there's going to be something unexpected and new pretty soon, like within six months. Hmm. I don't All think right. it's going to be masked on. Do you have a? You have a insight? Insider? No, I mean, oh, just, 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 <laughs> I didn't know if this was like, are you being oracular or is this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like it. That would be nice, actually, if something totally different. I mean, wow. these, these things happen really swiftly. And, um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm old enough to be like, you know, it was all Fenster and, and uh, Flickr, you know, that's yeah. in my space. And I don't, it's not like we left them. They just sort of eva evaporated because something else was working better. And so, like I said, I mean, I think we're going to go to Mastodon because, you know, it's a ship and our ship is on fire or sinking or blasting off into the, like, I don't know, it's just supernova. Um, but I feel like it's ripe for something different. I mean, I think all, because like Mastodon doesn't solve the problem of Instagrams. Like everyone misses just posting pictures. 
Mm. You know, there's yeah. something quiet. I think there's going to be a quiet space that's yeah. a little bit more still and curated um, as opposed to being this sort of relentless, I mean, you can feel the algorithmic paid social machine just coming for all your attention and all your eyeballs. And I think a place that doesn't feel like that probably won't be profitable is the problem, but <laughs> maybe <laughs> we're hungry for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm just thinking about, sorry, the Elon Musk and like the whole Twitter thing, him going on twitter and destroying it all and it reminds me of actually um this conference i think that you, i think you gave us a, a talk at it that I, I didn't get to see the whole like not uh what's it called like don't let them leave i think or something to that effect of a, uh are you about the, the salish sea anti-space symposium yeah yeah what yeah. is this what yeah can you talk about that uh what that was and uh, that was awesome. Yeah, it was organized by um, my neighbor, Daniel Smith, who is an artist locally here in Seattle. Um, and it was at Pipsqueak, which I think if it hadn't been the Gary International Black Film Festival, Pipsqueak would have been my number two. They're an anarchist art gallery um, down the street. And they're they're best known for having like writing letters to prisoners events. Like that's their sort of number one, like, oh, that place. Um, and they have all kinds of, you know, art shows and um, they really, really serving the like anarchist community from ages, you know, four to 400. Um, and so this festival was a bunch of speakers kind of, it was, it was around the 50th anniversary of the Apollo mission. And it was just as a, a lot of, you know, these, these billionaires are like, we're going into space, or we're going to the moon, or we're going to colonize Mars. And I think, you know, like after Twitter, it's like, you're doing what? No. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. No, no, try, try. At this point, like, go ahead. Give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it, works. I hope it works as well as the Twitter has. <laughs> Take all the billionaires. That will solve a lot of problems. <laughs> I think there was just this like, why, why are we doing, why are we spending money on getting to the moon when there's all these other issues? And so the symposium was like a wonderfully, I mean, it was very anarchistic combination of in like serious scientists and environmental speakers. Um, there was a, a man, I can't remember his name, but he had been, he was a member of the Tulalip tribe and he had been on Bill Clinton's cabinet for the environment and so he was talking about the forests and how forests that we think are quite old he's like those are young forests like everything has been destroyed you need older forests and um just talked about like these really complex issues around the environment um and then you had emmett montgomery who was telling jokes about the gum wall so he just <laughs> <laughs> talking about we space have it on Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it was just this kind of slice of people rejecting this kind of techno, you know, like boosterism vibe. Um, and so I gave I gave a talk called Witch Science on the Moon, um, which was my overview of the conspiracy of witches. Um, so this idea that that begin, well, I don't know how far back to go. It's like 20,000 years ago, right? <laughs> You've got mathematics percolating up from um, areas of it, sort of the Congo um, area, West Africa, Central Africa. And those ideas about mathematics and logic filter up through Egypt into Greece, Rome, and then up into, into Europe. And so the people we call witches were basically holding on to old forms of knowledge um, that the church was really dicey about, like, e you know. <laughs> that's bad we want to like not know about the stars um and so you have this this sort of you know the the intellectual pursuits of the little old ladies in the cottage down the street were sort of where all that old you know that that knowledge was sitting and the problem with being really embedded in in logical ways of thinking is you can't get to the moon Right. So in the olden days, you were able to do things like sort of shamanic activities. And you see this in particular in people in the Arctic Circle, where there's traditions of going to the moon, other forms of traveling through the sea in, in the air to sort of, you know, know what was going on with like the populations of animals that you were maybe hunting for sustenance, things of that nature. Um, and as you come into language, as you come into logic and mathematics, 
a lot of the ways of thinking when you move from gestalt um, into sort of the left to right or up and down or whatever way of tracking information and tracking, you know, you're counting, you've got letters, you're, you're just, you're assembling knowledge in your brain in a different way. And it seems to prevent that ability to get to the moon. And so the witches were having this problem. And so they were still able to fly, right? So they're able to, you know, get up on the brooms and do battles in the sky, but they couldn't get up into the atmosphere and they missed it. And it was a pain. And so like how, we can't go back, right? So we'll go forward with these logical systems, with mathematics, with, you know, all of these things. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll start to build things that will get us there. And so they had sort of an electromechanical solution to the problem. But, you know, the patriarchy is a son of a bitch. <laughs> so they're realizing that they're becoming, you know, they were maybe generations prior. They had been priestesses. They had been alchemists themselves. One of the um, most powerful alchemists in history was Cleopatra, not that Cleopatra, a different one in the century. Um, but the status of women was eroding. And so what they realized uh, was that they were going to have to kind of do a knowledge transfer over to the alchemists, who by and large were not always, but mostly men. So which is not all women, alchemists, not all men, but there tended to be this sort of we're in allegiance to the patriarchy and we are sort of off in the woods doing our own things kind of split. And uh, so like, look, we're going to let these guys have all of our secrets and we're going to orchestrate our way back up into the moon. And so this starts with Kepler. And so Johannes Kepler, who's the, uh, the grandfather of astrophysics, right? He sort of was the first person to really pull mathematics into the study of the moon. Well, his mother, Casarina, was a witch. She went to jail for witchcraft, um, you know, and she she held the old traditions alive. She wanted to get to the moon. And so Kepler wrote this novel called The Dream. And it's about um, it's the first science fiction novel. And it's about a witch and her son being taught by a demon to go to the moon. And there's these details like you're going to need to use a wet sponge over your nose and mouth so that you can deal with that atmosphere once you get up into the heavens. So it's a very scientific way of talking about using your demon, your familiar, um, as, as a method to get up there. And so the demon, which is, uh, you know, in, in medieval Europe, a demon is like this evil thing. It's this devilish thing. But a demon is like a jinn. It's your soul. Um, you know, the Greek philosophers thought of the demon as love. So it's a very different take on all these subjects. So that's that was awesome. that was what the talk was about. <laughs> that's fantastic. So amazing. I love it. Um, I'm wearing my NASA shirt, ironically, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. They just had the, the rocket that uh, you the Apollo rocket. And yeah. Previous now the Artemis one. Did you, did you have something you wanted to say about that? Me, me or yeah, me? yeah, yeah, you, oh, Megan, you. Um, I think you said you wanted to bring that up. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know it was funny because it was like, did I? <laughs> I had put all this energy into thinking about the 50 year anniversary, and I knew then like they had started to talk about like we're going to put women on the moon, and it was sort of this funny like, you know, the Apollo mission was like this. Well, I you know I kind of stopped halfway through the conspiracy, but. You know, so we're gonna we're gonna get to the moon, but we can't go there because again because of sexism. Um, so we're gonna you know Armstrong's gonna go on the moon. That's fine, but we're just gonna encode a bunch of like you know witchy spell stuff in the copper, um, the copper wired programmatic memory system of the guidance computer for for that mission. Um, and it was funny because I like I know in my head like all this <laughs> these elements of the Apollo mission like how the code was written and what's the first line of the ignition sequence and like what the different the two different kinds of memory and I was like this <laughs> this mission that went up this morning at like one a.m. I'm like I don't know how it was built I really wasn't tracking that one. <laughs> 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 like is it is it running on Linux like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So I just had an interesting um, sync. Uh, I uh, I've been shuffling through my tarot card deck, and it's 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 Greco Egyptian, um, and for some reason, I just pulled Artemis. Oh, 
Ah. So there you go. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that last night. I hadn't been paying attention, and I saw it yes last night, and I was like, oh my god, we got. I got to talk to Megan about this tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. This now, this is super relevant to. Um. So, do you want to? Start, is there more to the the next phase of things then about going? So, oh yes. Going yes. To the moon. You want to keep? You can keep going. I, I'm just fascinated with yeah. hearing you talk. Honestly. <laughs> Um, so let's see, Johannes Kepler, we stopped. There. Okay, yeah. So first, first science fiction novel is The Dream by Johannes Kepler. And it's like this detailed accounting of kind of this intersection of the old ways of traveling and then like trying to um, use, you know, these, these new ways of thought. Um, and so what you have is this um, development, you know, so what we call the Enlightenment, right? And it's not really the enlightenment. It's like the enlightenment of dudes who are really uptight about science because of the church for a long time, <laughs> right? Like the golden age in the Middle East was flourishing. India, we've got mathematics. China, we've got, I mean, like all of these other parts, you know, from, from Central Africa over to China, up into Ireland and, and Iran, you know, everybody's thinking. Everyone's got amazing scientific ideas. And Europe is like, we, we can't. We don't, we don't see it. And then I think, you know, like they took a breath and like, wait a minute. <laughs> We're going to stop murdering people for thinking the sun exists or whatever they think. You know? <laughs> like, and they're like, we've discovered all these things. It's the enlightenment. And everyone's like, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you see all of these sort of, you know, like put a flag in it type colonization of of knowledge and it sort of pre-existed and everyone else knew about um and so again you've got these these women sort of quietly in the background like we just want to get to the moon it's like crack right it's like crack for witches like i need to get to the moon whatever we have to do and so you have all of these like complex you know mathematical and scientific processes that are being developed that get you closer and closer and so these guys are like i you know i'm galvini and frogs are on fire whatever he's doing and but like the calculations are being done by these women who are probably witches and they're just kind of like i am a computer so computers for a few centuries there were these women who were doing the long hand to get the trajectories right so we can look at venus or or what have you and, you know, I mean, there's there's people who are sort of outliers like Ada Lovelace, who's like, <laughs> I'm Byron's kid. We're going to do computer stuff, you know. But by and large, you know, it was kind of meant to the front and women were like, we just got to get the project going. We need the moon crack. And um, I think the most interesting kind of moment where that starts to break open is at Bletchley Park. And so we know Alan Turing was there. And Alan Turing basically is like, here's computers. Um, and there were all of these women working there. And we know what the guys did. We know what Turing did. Um, and we lost him tragically because of homophobia. But we know what he did. There were legions of women working in cryptography, working alongside Turing. And we don't know what they did. And these women were like, I'm going to my grave with my secrets. <laughs> And so people like, and it's like, World War II is over. It's like, it's okay. It's the 70s. And they're like, nope, code of silence. And so what were those women doing? But what we do know is if you're Wiccan, which I am not, <laughs> because that is a religion. But if you're Wiccan, all of those texts were written by Doreen Valiente. I might be mispronouncing her name. She worked at Bletchley Park. She was a code breaker in Bletchley Park. Hmm. So the modern computer and the modern like witch's Bible come from the same place, came from the same room. The first digital computer is called witch. And so you start to see this intersection is just like so obvious that it kind of hurts your head that nobody like noticed. It was like hiding in plain sight this whole time. And so then you, then you get into the run up to the Apollo mission. And like it said, we're not going to put a witch in the capsule but all of the people doing the physical work of building the memory, which, you know, right now our computer chips are so small, you can't really see what's going on. But all of the core rote memory and the wire core memory, one of them is like an intersection, a grid, and the other one is like long ropes. And to the point where like a head programmer on the Apollo mission would be called a rope mother, 
which was a gender neutral term. Most rope mothers were men. Um, but all of the people doing the actual embroidery type action of these little magnetic toroids and copper wire going through it, uh, it was very, very small. And so it was all women. So you just have these like warehouses full of women programming <laughs> with a needle and thread. They're weaving copper to get to the moon. And we know we put in, they put in the, the computer code that Margaret Hamilton, not the woman that played the witch in the, in the, uh, the Wizard of Oz, Margaret Hamilton, who was the, the head programmer for NASA, um, they're weaving those instructions, but they're also putting in spells that help them to finalize that return to the moon that they had been denied for thousands of years. And so this prophecy, this project, this conspiracy is finally at its end when we get to the moon. Oh, and so, Amazing. so awesome. I've made a hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So this is a piece I made um, and you can, so it's like a crystal kind of tiara type situation with this veil and the veil itself is made of the same pattern that they use for core memory on the Apollo mission. Um, and these are magnetic toroids. You can kind of see them might be hard to tell it's down here. So these move, oop, these move. Whoa. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so the, the computer programming would go into this object with electrical pulses that would either spin it clockwise or counterclockwise. And that's how you'd store at the zero and one. It also makes a nice hat. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, it's, it's funny how little of this, um, there was, there was the Living Computer Museum here in Seattle for a little while. Um, I don't know if yeah. either you had a chance to go there. Is that gone now? Is it, no? it is, yeah, yeah. I don't think they could survive the, the pandemic because it was all interactive. Like, you have to, uh, like, let people touch that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they had, you know, on their second floor, they had, um, you know, the history of, of computing. And they had, um, you know, this massive sheet of, like, woven memory like with the copper wire and and the magnets and it's just like why didn't i know about this <laughs> this is just, like, it's amazing i mean it's just it's incredible like this this technology um that you know we used to go to the moon is is based on weaving like wow <laughs> and copper too and copper is the copper is the metal of venus i think i believe planetary metal of venus copper i didn't know that crap. Yeah, I, that is new information to me. <laughs> We're all about correspondences over here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> do you want to show some of the things you have these these art projects that you have, or do you have more? If you want to keep, if you have more to talk about about this, I, I think would... I think well, I think that's all I've got on my conspiracy of witches without like without slides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We can look at a lot of Greek sculpture that, um, no, I think I can just sort of grab random. Oh, I should show you my wand. I think everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Wand. Um, so I'm really into, well, let me start with the candle. So in a lot of traditions, um, so this is like a crystal, this is some family heirloom ish thing. I never know if these things are heirlooms or if it's just like, here, this is a family heirloom I picked up at Goodwill last week. <laughs> or if it's like, I've had this damn thing for so long, I'm just trying to get rid of it. <laughs> um, this is a this is a bay leaf candle, or bay candle, which is also seems to be some kind of family tradition. I'm gonna try to light this. Uh, my my people are Irish Catholic. I'm I'm not obviously, but that's where I come from. I cannot light a candle. <laughs> What have I done? Okay, we understand how candles work. <laughs> <laughs> Do we? Do we? <laughs> Anywho, um, I'm going to lose my train of thought. This is a candle. And so <laughs> in a lot of traditions, we, we sort of light a candle. It's a votive. There's an intention or a prayer that goes with the light. And that's a thing. That's a ritual we sort of all get. Um, tangent. I've What's heard that that on a birthday cake, the reason why it's shaped like a 
circle with the candles and you blow the wishes out it's it's supposed to be like carrying them to the moon um isn't that a whole thing like it's like a like the shape of it's like a moon and like the blowing them out uh i think it's related i i don't know if that's just an urban legend i read on the internet but i like i have to take notes for this to, okay so uh, this is funny that you were mentioning that <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true now now <laughs> every time I, I i'm just gonna start that's yeah Mooncake. Like that, Mooncake. I don't want to spread rumors on Wufo, but I think rumors about the origin of birthday cakes are allowable. <laughs> what I came here for. <laughs> but so um in in a lot of witchcraft practices, the sort of um one of the sort of grounding and most central acts is to create a circle and like the circle is protection the circle is no the circle is a holy space it's it's just this making of the circle becomes a kind of um you know the candle can be small or we can have lots of light you know we can make a small circle it can be a huge bond you know it, it, it's it's just kind of a universal symbol of making space to make intention for your practice for what what have you and so I kind of have this practice in my, this practice in my practice <laughs> called a circle is a sigil is a circuit is a spell. And so when we create a, a, an electrical circuit, we create a circle and we create a sigil and we create um, all of these things at the same time. And I think we think of, you know, technology and, and electricity as these sort of new, they're, they're not holy, they're from you know, they're from consumerism, from capitalism, what have you. But the thing is, if you look, if you think about the pentagram that witches are sort of identified with, um, which isn't really from witches, it's it's from Pythagoras, right? And which means it's probably from somebody in Egypt, which means it probably is from somebody in the Congo, right? Like that's kind of my, if witches are doing it, it came from Rome, it came from Greece, it came from Egypt, it came from something further up river. Um, but the health star is what it was called. So it's, uh, what is it? Earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Um, and that's like, oh, that's silly because we know the periodic table is much larger. But if we go back to the beginning of the universe, if we talk about the Big Bang Theory, you know, at the beginning, we have weak and strong force. We have gravity and we have electromagnetism. And so electricity is older than fire. It's older than water. It's older than the earth. It's older than everything. Um, that we know of other than just light. Um, but so making a circle with electrons to me is, is very, you know, we're, we're, con we're connecting with something that was there at the beginning. Um, and so to me, that's older and more holy than lighting a candle. So when I take something like this wand, which uh, let's see, we've got this sort of front piece, a bunch of copper wire. This is a voltaic pile here. So this is, oh, there's a magnet for my last demo so what we have here if we can see uh, we have a bunch of washers um they are zinc and copper so kind of like nickels and pennies if you had nickels and pennies you could do this uh, this is just easier because they have holes and i can put them on this nice wand and in between are pieces of felt and there's some vinegar on the felt so we've got our little salt bridge so if you ever made like a potato battery the potato is the salt bridge. It's allowing the electrons to flow from the copper to the zinc, the zinc to the copper. I'm going to, somebody has to fact check that for me. Like I do this all day long, but I'm like, I don't know which way, just the way the light goes. So if I, if we kind of, we can kind of look at this end point here, if I press here, you can kind of see it come on. So let's see. Yep. So there's the light coming on. I'm just pressing all of these together. So, you know, it's not the strongest flashlight in the world, um, but it works and it creates a circle and it creates a moment of intention. It creates a space. Um, and so I, I spend a lot of time just making these very organic um, spells um, around some intention that has to do with the electrons flowing. So this is a piece. Um, this is the... Uh, um, um, the Selkie spell. And so this was about environmentalism. So it sat in a vat of Salish seawater. And then behind me is a great big bog battery. So we can see back here, we've got our little light in this wax uh, sort of beacon. 
you can see little zinc and copper electrodes inside each of these cells. Um, and then this is a piece of bo uh, butter wrapped in bog. Wait, can we see that? Ah, there we go. There's some butter wrapped in the bog. So these are peat bogs. And there's just these little batteries that are also bogs. So we've got current running through um, this, this bog. So it's a bog battery. <laughs> and this is a this is a spell against famine. And so that's the butter that's buried in the bog is just like in Ireland, the way that they dealt with, you know, if cattle raiders would come through and steal your grain and steal your cattle, you could go out into the bog, dig up some butter and make it through the winter. So that's how I appro approach working with electricity. I think we talked about the bog butter on Twitter a long time ago because like that someone had like recently uncovered a bunch of like really old bog butter that was still hanging out. I don't know what? how old it was, but it was like it was like really old. Yeah, like three thousand years, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> I remember that's like one of my first memories with you is like us freaking out about bog butter on Twitter or something. <laughs> so the, the, the ultimate question is like, would you try it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. In a in a hot second. Yeah. I mean, the, the bogs are amazing refrigerators, right? Like they preserve anything. They dissolve calcium. So there's no bones left. So like, you know, cause they're always digging up bog bodies and they're like, Oh God, you know, our neighbor Greg must've murdered somebody. And then they're like, Oh no, that body is like 4,000 years old. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun. <laughs> like it's fine. Um, but yeah, there's no oxygen in the bog. And so you can, anything that goes in there, just all the calcium gets leached out. It gets dyed black because of the sphagnum moss. There's some chemical in there that dyes everything. Um, and it will last for a very long time. Um, it's a great database, much better than like access or. <laughs> That's that amazing. Weird. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> bogs as a database is really good um you had something else on your desk you showed me earlier too is that is that another battery oh yeah there's all sorts of let's see so i have yeah, do some more show and tell because it's really good okay so um this piece um it's sort of already run its course so it doesn't light up anymore um this piece is called cold war sigil um and so it's a it was a spell against war um and it's it's a you know it's a salt water battery so there's salt water and then we've got these zinc and copper electrodes there's a little led up here and it's kind of held in place with these um these little clips and you can kind of see the water's mostly evaporated so it doesn't really work anymore but we have these lovely salt crystals that have formed um, along the front of, of each of these battery cells. And so that I'm also really interested in creating these moments of electrical activity and then just this very organic process that's happening simultaneously. So it's not just this moment of electrical on, it's also the, the rest of the physical properties of this, you know, the circuit. And so again, we, we live in a world where we have all of this computer technology whizzing around us, but it's very occult, right? It's very hidden. Um, but all these mechanisms and, and Jeremy, what, you know, what you were saying about going to the museum and seeing like, here it is, here's this giant copper woven hard drive. We have a really different relationship to that computer system because we can see all its parts. So seeing the parts, seeing the decay is really important to me. And it's hard to see, but you, there's like little white dollops at the bottom. So these are iodine tablets. They're also known as radiation pills. Um, they're what you take when there's a nuclear war. And so it protects your thyroid. It fills it up with iodine. And then when the bomb drops, you have, you know, like, I don't know that it helps that much, <laughs> it's like, but it's a thing. And I grew up in the cold war. And so when things got a little dicey with Russia this year, it's like, oh, let me go to Amazon and buy some radiation <laughs> tablets. And I'm like, this is nuts, you know? Um, so the only way you can deal with sort of an impossible and irrational world is to make an impossible and irrational electrical system in response as sort of an offering to the universe. Like, please don't let a bomb drop on me or anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty of doing the same. I got a bottle of it. <laughs> Dashed away, like 
And then, of course, there's people who say, like, oh, seaweed. Seaweed is full of iodine. You should, like, you can just eat a bunch of seaweed and, you know, that'll help, too. You got some seaweed? You got some seaweed. Yeah. This is, uh, it's seawater for the, for salt batteries. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's you awesome. Know. Did you know that those big, like, so you know that this is plant factoid. Those giant, um, the bull kelp, you know, the bull kelp that you see, like. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Like they have that. So if, if you've never seen them to, to people who are watching. So they, they're these enormous, long, huge um, seaweed entities. And they wash up on the beaches in the Pacific Northwest quite a lot. I don't know if they are also found in the Atlantic too. Um, but they're, ah, gosh, it's really hard to describe them, but they're these giant tubes, like really, really long tubes. And they have like, you know, typical leaves kind of on one end of the tube. And then the other end is actually attached to a rock at the bottom. So it anchors it. And I guess like when there's a storm or something, what will happen is it'll either come detached from the rock or the rock will be so small, it'll wash it up on the shore. Um, and one of the things people do with them the most uh, in in the, the edible foraging community is they slice them and stuff them with string cheese. And <laughs> or like they pickle, they pickle them. Mm -hmm. And then they stuff that with string cheese as a snack. Anyhow, that was a very long and roundabout way of saying those are single cells. That is a single cell in that organism. Whoa. Wow. They're single celled organisms. And if you've ever seen one of these things and you pick it up and you look at it, you'll be Ooh. like, oh, yeah, I've never actually like there are no cell. It is a cell. Yeah. And it's just, like, that to yeah, me is seamless. Like, they're seamless for sure. Yeah. I um I it's funny um my my neighbors are here one of one of whom Marcus might have a story for us but um he he brought me um pickled hmm? pickled, kelp. pickled kelp when he went to uh, Orcas Island Orcas Island which is yeah. which is just up north here and you know as a kid I remember bull kelp when we were on the beach you would swing it. And you get that, like, I think this is where drone metal actually comes from. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like kids on the beach going, woo, woo, woo. Yeah. <laughs> what are you, uh, like a bull roarer? Is that? <laughs> is that what? Yeah. The, yeah, the uh, uh, Australian um, indigenous instrument, the bull roarer, makes that noise. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so cool. Now I want to go and make an instrument out of, like, a single-celled organism that you can also pickle and stuff with cheese. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, there we go. Oh, I'm going to hit the... I almost hit a candle. <laughs> Careful. Gary's going to, like, burn down his whole basement. Does Amber know you're doing this? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> almost broke something. This is very Dogma 95 all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough space in here. Oh, well. Kai, was, Kai just says it's, it was International Pickle Day this week, and I can't believe I missed it. Was think, it really? I think I think we need to maybe um, come up with uh, another day sometime relatively soon that celebrates pickles in a different... Instead of, instead of international, perhaps we could do, like, interplanetary? Yes. Interplanetary <laughs> Pickle Day? With moon cheese. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Put We're some moon cheese in that in that uh in that kelp. Yeah. So if if somebody was interested, like just one of our viewers who knows very little about like who who like me, I like I have none of the like Garrett is kind of our tech person more, and I'm more of like the occultism person. Um where would like me, where would I get started if I wanted to make something like your wand, for example? Mm -hmm. Like, are there instructables? Like, are you? Yeah, yeah. This is, I mean, I, th I think everyone is like, knows the potato battery. And if you yeah. don't know the potato, I mean, like Google potato battery, this is, you know, like find a six year old. They did it in science class last week, maybe eight. I don't know. I don't know. Little people, little people. <laughs> <laughs> what the children know about the potatoes. But basically, you know, to to light up, say, an LED, which is a LED, <laughs> LED. <laughs> I got to make a meme about that. Um, to get current, 
Um, you, you just basically need zinc and copper. So a, a nickel and a penny in something that will conduct the electrons. And so it can't be regular water. It has to be salt water. It can be vinegar. It can be a potato. It can be a lemon. Pickle uh, it, juice? Pickle it, juice. It pickle juice. Absolutely. It can be, it can be wet <laughs> oil. So these bogs work because the earth is so damp. And so it just has to be, you know, copper, zinc, copper, zinc, copper, zinc with wires, and then you'll get something. So I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Yeah. Do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I've got like, like my little fancy handmade electrodes, but it's the same thing. Just imagine instead of cute glass jars, it's a potato and some, some pennies and nickels. See you. Hang on. A cute potato? A cute potato. <laughs> <laughs> All potatoes are cute. Okay. I like these ideas in the comments. Bull kelp, uh, slice bull kelp on pizza fried in bog butter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I want all of that. Yes. So let's see. So this is like a real time tech demo. Never do this. Okay. So I've made these like electrodes, but the key parts are copper and zinc. So again, pennies, pretend these are pennies and pretend these are nickels nickels is what is what we've got and so we need to create our salt bridge or just our whatever you want to we can call these just potatoes right these are our potatoes um so i'm going to use this seaweed infused salt water from the pacific ocean i feel like i'm making cocktails oh. <laughs> Oof. very very witchy in here okay I also enjoy that I'm making all like it's like salt water and my electronics all in one. <laughs> Don't do this. Okay. So so again, imagine these are potatoes, right? And so here's our LED. So we're looking for this guy to light up. And so we would do in our potato number one, we go um nick uh let's see. Nickel, yeah, nickel. And then we wouldn't put the same, maybe I need to come out a little bit. We wouldn't put the same coin and wire on the same potato. You go to the next potato, right? So this wire is going from here to here. And then we just repeat that process, alternating. So here's another nickel, here's a penny, here's a nickel. And we're gonna look for this guy to light up. We should complete the circuit. Didn't really work. I think we don't have quite enough voltage, so we're probably pulling just under a volt on each of these, uh, which isn't quite enough. So I'm gonna add another potato um, slash seaweed cocktail. So here we go. Let's see if we can. And I've got one more electrode in here, so I'm gonna pull. Now I'm confused. Okay, this one goes to here. This one's gonna go here. That one's gonna go there. Let's see if this, nope. <laughs> this really, oh, there we go. There we go. There Yay. He is. Yay! So, and you know, it's it's pretty fragile. Everything's a little wonky here in the witch lab. Um, but that's how easy it is to get just about three volts of current from potatoes or salt water and just two disparate metals. So we're using copper and we're using some zinc and some salt water. So, but to me, this just looks a lot more magical. It's easier for me to like communicate with it as a space of intention. A circle is a sigil, as a circle is a spell, right? And so what can I put into this experience of gathering these things, of making this light happen? And to me, this is just much more of um, a potent, ritual than taking a Bic lighter to a piece of wax. Uh, I think that's something cool too is, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt if you. Oh, so I would, you know, so you can just Google something like that, start there. And then you, you sort of, once you get it, you just keep going. And I think when you infuse your own sort of like, I want to do this weird thing, it's much easier to take on. You know, I think the way that we learn a lot of science is really like, so dry. And I think for all of us, whether we're more tech or we're more occult, you know, it's like, oh, I want to do this neato thing. And the minute you have that pull, 
you just start to amass how all these things fit together in your own language. That is really cool. <laughs> um, I was going to say the, the other thing that's really cool about it to me, um, we talk a lot on WUFO about how um, like the creative process and art are almost one-to-one -one identical with the magical process about using the creative process to like change reality and, and create a new space in some way. Um, and this like, this hits all those buttons for me too. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Alchemy. It's all, it's all alchemy. And, and, and so that, that, that business I was mentioning some time ago about how we sort of put witchcraft over here and alchemy, we're like, Oh, that's a proto science. And it's like, it's all the same stuff. Like these guys were just like, smoking weed, trying to make goals, like looking at the stars. I mean, like it, they just, it was just, they were people were interested in, in thinking and doing and making. Um, and I think that that business where I was like, it kind of messed the witches up when they learned about logic because it, it prevented them from going to the moon. And I think that same way, when we get into this really siloed and capitalist way of thinking, where it's like, I have this role and I will only think about this one thing. Well, that's super efficient for scaling up to like giant industry, but it's not very human. I think it's human when we pull all these things together and, and it, you know, it looks chaotic. I think if you're, if you're in a really, in a very industrialized part of time, uh, but I think if you plucked somebody from a bog who wasn't dead, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, <laughs> I think they'd, they'd resonate much more with like the sort of chaotic amalgamation of everything than somebody who was like a really good, you know, widget, widgeter. I don't know. I don't want to. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> widgeter. <laughs> Widget widgeter. <laughs> <laughs> we should get the business cards with widgeter. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, <clears throat> has me percolating a bunch. I can't wait to like mess around with this. I love your idea of just like starting here and like s helping to like you know build new th more things off of this. And uh, I think in the tangibleness of this is really excited. I I'm like I'm imagining running down to the water right after this and collecting some seawater just to start this process yeah um, well and and that and that thing where it's like okay you've got the circuit going and i feel like when you do the potato experiment you're like okay and now i have like weird potatoes with coins in them <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be the strangest thing in my house yeah, it was like, <laughs> but Hear me out. Um, but like when you when you work with salt crystals, you know, from the ocean, there's all kinds of other stuff that comes along with that. And then when the water evaporates, you've got these salt crystals. And I love working with naturally formed crystals because the crystal industry, which is big in occult circles, um, is not great. It's you know, it's like the diamond trade. It's like maybe make your own crystals from ocean water. That's an awesome idea. And it's so e it's really easy. I, I make sea salt all the time. It's like very, very easy. What I'm wondering though is um, I wonder if there would be different effects using water from different sources or salt, salt water from different sources. Um, I mean, it probably would be extremely subtle effects, but like if I get Florida seawater and it, it, in Puget Sound seawater, is there like, the I mean, it's salt, salt is salt, but <laughs> what's that? To the magic or to the electricity? To the magic. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. The, the land and the place. But I, I will say um, this piece, the uh, the Cold War sigil piece. So this is number two. Number one went to Berlin. There was an, It was an art show. And I didn't want to ship, you know, seawater and radiation tablets through customs. <laughs> because <laughs> that's not fun. So I had the curator, I was like, look, I'm going to ship some stuff to you. I need you to buy some stuff. And then can you go grab some, some seawater? And he's like, maybe, I don't know if I'll have time. And I'm like, okay, but I know all these random crypto dudes in Denmark. So maybe they'll like, they're, they're really supportive of my art career for some reason. Um, Twitter brought us all together. 
And I was like, hey, can one of you like grab some ocean water from Denmark for this project? And they're like, yeah, we it, it wouldn't work. It's 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 brackish. It's not it's not the salinity is like completely different than ocean water. And I'm like, what? I hadn't like <laughs> just this whole like if the ocean comes to the border of your country, that's seawater. And they're like, nope. <laughs> and huh. I learned something new, but it was just like, oh, like this is not electrically conductive water. Interesting. So, <clears throat> what you what did what did you end up doing for that? The curator was like, "Okay, I'll go to Brighton and get you some like, <laughs> a bottle." Or something. <laughs> like wrapping it up, but um, you know, and I get that. I mean, like you're you're juggling a whole bunch of artists. The last thing you want is like a witch's supply list. Like, go into the forest, <laughs> find a mushroom that speaks to you. Like, they, no, they're not. Like, they want, they want a framed painting that we can hang on the wall. <laughs> I like this idea of using water from a UFO hotspot. Oh um, yeah. That's go to the, the, Mo the Maury Island incident. We should go get some water right from there. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's so close. I mean, technically we could just go, I mean, you could just go to the waterfront and remember it's the same water. It's the, true. It's... <laughs> Might be a shrimp in it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like the bog batteries have worms in them, I'm sure, or something. I mean, there's Venus flytraps full of, I mean, there's, I mean, a whole ecosystem is existing within the functioning battery, which I really dig. That's awesome. Where did, where did you uh, source your bog back here? Ernst. Where, where's that? No, it's, it's an old like home and garden store. Oh, it's how? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's 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 um it, i mean it's it's moss from all over my house um uh -huh. and then it's uh lava rocks at the bottom and then um just peat moss um and that's a, and you know and and water um uh -huh. and some yeah it's and then no oxygen like it's this really fat, like there's plants with roots but the roots are just anchors so you're talking about like the bull kelp and the the rock at the bottom um but it's just, yeah, they're like all the nutrients come from from the sky and from bugs. So it's anaerobic. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. From like the microbial standpoint, I'm really curious as to. Well, that's and that's why things last for so long. There's just. Of it's course. Like, yeah. And um, yeah, it's and it's it takes I mean, it's like millions of years for it to develop. And it's wild because like it was thought of more in more recent history i think it was like a really sacred space back in the day but then it was kind of this wasteland and people would go cut up the peat and dry it and use it for fuel and it was sort of just this like low you know it was like we can't afford coal all we've got is is peat but now what they've realized is that the peat bogs both um you know there's a lot in ireland and scotland but also in the congo uh tropical there's huge tropical peat bogs down there um, it's like the biggest carbon sink on the planet, like more than any forest. And I actually, tw I've deleted like all my tweets past a week ago, but like <laughs> at some point Elon Musk was like, I'll pay a million dollars for like the most efficient, you know, carbon sinks technology. And I'm like, it exists. It's peat bogs. Let's just stop, you know, messing with them. <laughs> like leave them because alone. They're, they're endangered now too, if yeah. I recall correctly. I mean, I, you know, this is all coming more from like the, permaculture landscaping side of things where, you know, the gardening industry basically has decimated peat bogs, um, which is to say, you know, you can get it ethically sourced, uh, but mm -hmm. if you're going to use something at home for your garden, like look into alternatives, like um, coir mm -hmm. is a really big one right now. Although coir is made of coconut and that is also a problematic industry in many parts of the world too. So um, yeah, it's all complicated. That's why I was kind of like, I got it at Ernst, which is like, you shouldn't do, but I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> to talk about the environment. <laughs> but it's probably a million people thinking the same thing. But Yeah. That's awesome. I got to step away for just a sec. I'll be right back. Okay. <clears throat> well, maybe while um, Jeremy's stepping away, Marcus can join me. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. My, my next door neighbor who, do you want to grab that? Yeah. Sure. Um, 
who's been privy to a lot of <laughs> the bog activity has been like a backyard neighborhood <laughs> like project. And so Marcus lives next door and he's got, um, we've got like dueling bog projects kind of going on. Right. Cause you've got your own little ecosystem challenges. Yeah. It's more of a frog sanctuary <laughs> and uh, it's turning into a raccoon sanctuary. So, oh. yeah. but I'm learning to, uh, to coexist with them in that space. I got some work to do. I've been gone for uh, 31 days. I just got back last night. So I'll work on that in the near future. So are there, are there raccoons? Uh, are they there because of the frog? Are they? No, no, they, just... they, they like to hang out in our neighborhood. And I think they just discovered it and, and they found it was a source for little fish. I have a little oh. mosquito eater fish in there to, to maintain yeah. low, low mosquito uh, levels. And uh, I think they, think they enjoy the free fish and maybe <laughs> something to splash around in because uh, <laughs> after the first visit and they ransacked the whole place i put it back together thinking it was an isolated thing then a few weeks later they're like oh more fish and so <laughs> i'm like all right well let's just try the third time and well third time wasn't the charm they just keep coming back and snacking and so i'll, I'll figure out i'm thinking about a geodescent dome that goes over it so they can't get into it. <laughs> and, and there was kind of this moment this summer where like, I'm trying to figure out how to put bogs in these like hands hack cubes. And I was getting all this, like, you know, just like the potato battery. I was just Googling like how to build a mini bog terrarium. And there was a lot more moisture and decayed material involved in like the advice I was getting from like instructables. So it was just like, my bogs like stank and they were full of bugs. And I'm like, I can't put these in a gallery. <laughs> <You know me? laughs> so just like, so we're just like these dueling eco projects of like, what do you, you know, like let nature. Yeah. <laughs> nature will teach you what to do. That's amazing. Um, did you have a pair of uh, oh, yeah, yeah. specific, story you're gonna tell uh, yeah i do it's, it's, it's pretty fresh um so i got i'll give you a little bit of backstory context here i have a friend his name's daniel huffman also goes by time captain he uh he has a radio host in denton texas he has a radio show that i listen to frequently and it's a mixture of music and paranormal talk so he has people from all over the world to contact him specifically about CE five events. I don't need, know if I need to get into CE five events, but uh, so therefore he entertains and talks about in a serious way. It's not, he's not, it's, there's not a comedic element to it. It's uh, it's uh, he, he's, he's very much into it. And so I, I follow him on social channels and such. And he was pointing out some, or displayed some photos that he took in the San Luis Valley in Colorado, central Colorado, which apparently has lots of paranormal activity. And uh, he was out there visiting a town called Crestone, which also has lots of paranormal activity. So he's just hanging out, just, just checking it out. And uh, he, he takes lots of infrared photography hmm. and he found what looked to like a pyramid out in the, the, the deserty portion of the San Luis Valley. And it's, it's shaped differently than the, the surrounding Hills. And, it's got a, a peak to it. And so he's just started taking infrared photos of the area. And that particular uh, pyramid had radiated uh, in a different, uh, you know, frequency, if you will, uh, than, than the surrounding area. So he, he pointed it out. He's like, well, isn't this odd? And I just happened to be driving from Seattle to Austin via the, the, uh, the Rocky Mountains down through that valley. So I said, "Hey, I, give me the drop me the coordinates. I want to go just check it out. Just I just want to walk around on it and and experience it and see see what's out there. It's on my way." So uh, so that I did. And <clears throat> when I got out there, uh, I, I, I was limited on time. I was very mindful of my time because I was trying to make it to Santa Fe by sunset. I was allowing plenty of time for myself uh, though. So I pulled off, uh, navigated myself there. And uh, when I get out there, it's gorgeous desert, you know, environment. And I find it, drove up to it. I'm like, okay, there it is. This is great. Uh, I followed the coordinates. And um, when I got out there, it was very calm, very quiet, no signs of people anywhere around. No, you know, you, you, I drove past the, some farms and such to get out there. But once I got out there, there wasn't any 
you know, it, there wasn't any, uh, any homesteads or farms or anything out there. So I kind of started walking around and I'm like, okay, I think I can get to the top of that pyramid. Just, just, just to check it out. It's not very tall. It looks like maybe three to 400 feet tall. It's not a serious climb, but as I start walking up to it, I notice a fence. I was like, okay, this is a fence. That's not a normal fence. This is like, it looks more like a, it's not an electric fence. It's not really going to keep anybody out, but it's more like a tripwire style fence. And, and I know that this is uh, this property, this area is managed by the, the BLM, which is the, uh, the uh, uh, Bureau, Bureau of Land Management. Management. Um, and so, uh, which is federal. And, and I was like, okay, well, you know, this is interesting. I, I, I'm mindful of my time. If I feel like if I trip this wire, then, you know, I'm going to alert somebody and I don't know if I need to be carted off by the feds right now. So <laughs> I decided to just kind of walk around and observe, you know, look at it from different sides and angles. And, and at one point I found an area where I can just kind of walk up, walk up a little bit. So I started walking up there and I don't know, it just felt like, you know what? I don't know if I need to be doing this right now. <laughs> I do want to know more about this, but now's not the moment. So uh, I decided I'm going to go on with my day, with my time. Um, but during this time, uh, while I'm there, I, got, I sort of lost track of time. There was a, a little bit of a, um, uh, I wouldn't call it time distortion, but but it seemed like a lot of time went by. <laughs> it was like, I tried to account for it and I couldn't. And uh, so I decided, you know what? I'm just going to get on to my plan. I had so many plans in motion. So I left. I uh, And then I followed up with my friend about this, told him about you know, my visit out there, you know, I, I w wasn't exceptional. I didn't get to experience anything, but he, he did ask me specifically, he's like, did you have any time issues? And I said, what do you mean by time issues? He's like, did you lose, did you lose track of time or did you lose time? I was like, yes, actually I did do that. And he's like, mm -hmm, yeah, <laughs> he's, and he, he says that there's that whole Valley. Uh, there's like sand dunes to the, to the East. Uh, I'm on the West side of the Valley. Um, you know, there apparently there are many visitations there, so so I've been informed. And uh, really, all it did to me is is just showed me yes, I need to go back there, but with with lots of time. Uh, so it's not really that I had much of a paranormal experience as much as I just it piqued my curiosity and it made me, you know, it's almost like a trip in its own. So if for for the sake of this, I can send you the coordinates gps yeah, the, yeah. The, the google google earth coordinates and you could put them up there and it's pretty interesting because when you when you go to the coordinates you look the satellite image looks like a pyramid it's like one side is like bushes or trees that come to a point in a very you know pyramid shape but then the back side doesn't so you know it's not confirmed that it is a pyramid but uh, there's many cases all over the earth of uh structures that were thought to be hills and then determined oh they actually are pyramids they're just they're overgrown because they're hundreds or thousands of years you know since people you know maintain them or whatnot i think we need the coordinates and i think we need to find find out who how to get in touch with the time captain oh yeah i've got him. both i've got okay. both yeah i've got yeah. i can send them to you right now and post okay them up there. I, it looks like people are like tell us more about that. yeah okay so yeah we're, we'll we'll find the time captain for y'all <laughs> yeah yeah it, he's got a, his show is on kuzu denton radio it's a it's, you can find it online kz KUZ.com, I believe. And it's Time Captain. I think it's Saturday, Saturdays from 1, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time. Cool. Right on. <laughs> this isn't the plug for it. Like, I just, That's this is how I know. <laughs> it's, right a, it's, a, it's fun. I mean, his, his music's awesome. Like, the music <laughs> that he, you know, highlights on the show. And that's really what got me there. But, uh, but it turns out that I love the interviews too. There's so many fascinating interviews from all types of people from pilots to, you know, like the, who've witnessed lots of uh, UFOs and such. And uh, again, like the CE5 experts and such, which is a, just a fascinating concept to me. So cool. Yeah. All right. There you go. Thanks. Thank you. That's awesome. Please send it to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a little mission. That's great. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> That's awesome. That sounded fantastic. There's, a, I mean, this whole block is like, I mean, we've got the the time machine on the corner. So. Yeah, I know. You said that you're right around the block from the 
the time travel mailbox. Oh, yeah. that's which I heard cool. recently. I think Travis Ritter posted about the fact that it's like turn. At least that week, it was like a, it turned into a little library, free library. Yeah, it's just like he, full of books. He he's my housemate. Oh, I didn't I didn't realize. That. <laughs> Hi, That's Travis. <laughs> he's in California right now. Uh, yeah. I think he's on a time di dilation journey too. But um, yeah, yeah, we're. But yeah, there's a there's a whole. Um, and then when the when the guy from the Times came to take my picture for the article about y'all, uh -huh. he was like, "What is it with this block?" <laughs> <laughs> it is a good block. There's a lot of weird stuff there. Totally. Yeah. 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 I got a I got an email today from someone at Union Health at the end of the block who was like, um, I my my synthesize my home synthesizer business is going so well, I'm back to offering acupuncture. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. There's like uh the the hollow earth radio used to be there the radio station that my wife and i started um and i it was it's so funny i don't know if many people know this but there's also a kombucha shop mm -hmm. i don't know if that is that still there community oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's a kombucha shop where they brew like lots of big uh it's um vats of kombucha and our transmitter is actually in the closet of the kombucha shop which i think is the funniest thing it was like the radio station that brought us out of the closet in the kombucha shop um but it's just like tons of weird little businesses all in that and then like yeah that's where my friend jake found the letter from a time traveler and it's just like always has weird energy there sir mix a lot sings about that street going down 23rd and union yeah um <laughs> yeah that um oh i forgot what i was gonna say oh no yes i, I remember the uh the kombucha shop being there with like the the transmitter were you getting some like microbial amplification amplification oh, yeah you know some like <laughs> i mean you know that's some that's some solid microbe action there speaking of amplification and seaweed um it what's what's the name it's this the most expensive skin cream in the world do you know jen it's like de la mer something de la it's like Two hundred dollar face cream, right? It's like here. Let me let me Google. <laughs> Can you Google the like? It's like De La Mer or Skid. So anyway, it's it's this like secret formula, expensive skin cream, and the deal is this guy sells it to like I don't know whoever owns it, like one of the big Estee Lauder or somebody, and he's got this like batch of seaweed, and he records it. And then he feeds the recording back to more seaweed that he, so it's this fermentation process that happens while he plays the sound of fermentation to the seaweed. And that's what the skin cream is made of. And this is like rich people's skin. Like this isn't like hippie. <laughs> this is like, like the Kardashians probably have this stuff and they're, you know, it is. I don't know. I mean, to be perfectly honest, it sounds worth every penny to me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so they got these like real to real tapes with like the recording, the like archival recording of like this guy's kombucha or not kombucha, but like fermenting seaweed to make skin cream. And it's like trade secrets. And oh man, I would love to like use that for like instead of a spirit box, is the sound of seaweed fermenting. That's. Uh... Maybe there's something to it. Maybe we should. Maybe we should do that. Yeah, well, I, I almost bought Lori Goldston's uh, one of her amps to do this with. And she okay. was like kind of horrified. She's like, "No, this isn't like this is a very like <laughs> this is equipment for like music, not yeah. weird seaweed <laughs> art." <laughs> it absolutely. Like, this is but the we most haven't... amplifier in existence. <laughs> We've never hooked up the fluorophone to seaweed before. Ooh. Oh yeah, we should I'm do that if we should get some. I cream mean, if de you... la mer. CJ Wilwright's got it. It's cream de la mer. Oh. There we go. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I don't know if it will work because it, I don't know if it will. Oh, we had a comment yep. from the Earth about the guy who uh, makes mushroom music, but. We do that too. Um, yeah. So you know, so you can go back back to our TikTok, uh, 
and we have a like Garrett's got he invented this device that not really. I mean, would you say invented or built? No, or? I don't think invented. I just hook things together that maybe had not been hooked together. I think that there were maybe people who messed with phenomes and and the stuff. Yeah, uh, but basically, it, yeah, it just takes the the thing that makes it, plants make music instead of making music it, it lets the plant talk using like yeah. different english phenomes so it makes it kind of sounds like a robot talking yeah. to you do you have coco nearby i don't have it hooked up no that's okay I, otherwise i would show show yeah. her off um yeah coco is my bathroom plant that um <laughs> You know, she's not doing so well. And I don't know if it's because I haven't been like chatting with her or what. What's going oh, on? No. Oh, bummer. Yeah, she seems a little cold? colder. Maybe because it's cold. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know what it makes me think? We should do acupuncture on her. Acu. <laughs> oh, yeah. Acupen. Did you see this video where we were? We were at um, Port Gamble, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. At the Walker Ames house, uh, and they had this this witch elm in the back. It's this giant, curved spiral like dryad that's like just sitting there behind the house. And you know, you walk under it, and it's like, whoa! I know and they, they, uh, this house though is like the most haunted house in Washington. But then there's this amazing tree that we were just like, <laughs> I don't even know if I want to go in the house. Like this exactly. is, yeah. we're freaking out about this tree. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you know, we found a lot of, of, of sinks with it and stuff. And then later on, I have this, um, like an electric AccuPen, like a, you know, you, you use it to find AccuPoints and then it gives you a little jolt. And, uh, you know, suppo supposedly it, there's something to it. Um, but I just got it because it sounded like a fun thing to play with. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and it seems to work like, you, you know, it's got so it's got this uh, setting that'll let you um, like the higher the pitch, the closer you are to an acupoint on the body. And mm -hmm. it seems to map to the ones, you know, on the diagram. So, you know, there's 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 something there there. Um, but we decided to try it with this tree and we did it and we found that we actually got results at the leaf nodes. Yeah. Whether or not there was a leaf there. Yeah. Uh, and those are like the places that the leaf kind of grows out of the stem. Um, it would make noises cool. and just go crazy. And we tried it with like dead sticks on the ground and didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really, really cool. So we should do that for Coco and film it. Yeah. So yeah like acupuncture yeah. on plants. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's just there's so much electricity and electrical information that's just there, whether or not, you know, we've got, you know, a power grid or not. It's just <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. I was just thinking about um, I got my amber. Oh, yeah. It was, you know, it generates static electricity by mm -hmm. rubbing it on things. Well, you know what the Greek word for amber is? Electron. Yeah. <laughs> that's where the word, I mean, that's the, the Greeks were like the first to put, they're like, okay, here's a property. And then that word trickled up into these, you know, Renaissance guys were, or uh, Enlightenment guys were like, ah, we'll call it this, you know? Yeah. They were, they had like, it was funny, like they had a sort of linguistic problems with like what they were actually referring to. You know, like, is it the substance? Is it the property? Like, there's a whole... Um, I can't even quite wrap my head around what the issue was. <laughs> it was like... Um, it's such a, like, nebulous thing. Like, um, someone was telling me, like, you'll find these old, like, electrical engineering guys. And they're like, yeah, we don't really know how it works. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they're wizards. Like, or they're total wizards. Like, you know, they can, they can do all the stuff in these equations. But they're just like, it's just kind of this strange thing that we can kind of describe and that's actually kind of heartening <laughs> um i don't know if i talked about this on the show yet but um i i brought this up with you megan i i saw someone had made something that had like uh i don't know what it's called photosensitive cell or something mm -hmm. um so basically it had this wand thing 
that it uh, measures differences in the light. Mm -hmm. And this device that they had made takes those changes in the device in the in the light and turns it into music. And so the idea is that you could go outside and point it at the moon and it's sensitive enough that the changes in the the moonlight will basically be playing music. It's kind of like the plant talker thing. Instead Mm of uh, using the bio data from the plant, it uses moonlight. And I really want to figure out how to basically emulate the plant talker, but like point it at the moon and have the moon talk. I think that would be like, if we could figure that out, we, we chatted about that a little bit. Um, like you, it seemed, you think there may be some challenges there, but I think I'm excited about that idea. Um, I just want to make everything talk so I can, I can yeah, understand no, it. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, the thing is like all of these sensors, all these sensing systems, um, you know, at the end of the day, all it is is saying, take something super like mushy and analog and put put it into a pretty discrete signal that I as a computer can do something with. And so these like a photoresistor isn't that much different than a light switch. It's just instead of, you know, like a light switch is like on off and your photoresistor is going to get a lot of data, but it's basically saying, you know, there's a point where something's going to change. And so sort of in between is like a light dimmer, right? Yeah. But here we've got on and off and that's like a very digital idea. And then over here, we have sort of like the quantum realm. (laughs) (laughs) And then over here, we have sort of analog, which can get really like meaty and complex. And then at some point, we sort of take things and say, hey, we're going to have a system that divides this into a few more states. Like maybe we have five states or seven states. You know, maybe it's a notation system or an alphabet. Um, And so so with the moon thing, it's just, you know, how do you... How do you filter out everything that's not the moon? Because like, it's this, okay, here's here's the problem. We see the moon and it's it's the blood moon and it's full and it's beautiful and it's amazing. And then we take a picture of it and we put it on Instagram. And it's just, the magic is not there. It, it right. looks like a street light, it's blurry. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're going to have the same problem. So ha- So you have to, you know, like, do you need a zoom lens or do you need a box that's only pointed at the moon? in a dark place, you know, it's just, it's just figuring out how to get at that signal. But, but, you know, a, a, a switch is a switch and, you know, the more complicated the array, the better, but it's all just like, boop, boop, one and one and done. I have some, hold on. I got, I have something to show and tell real quick. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is, um, <clears throat> Could you just, instead of saying, I want trying to contact or do this with the moon, just say, like, the night sky? <laughs> well, then you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, what the source is, you know. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think you can do it with the moon. You just have to, you have to isolate it. And then the problem with light resist, I'm going to get really nerdy here. <laughs> so the I'm problem with light <laughs> is this celebration, right? Um, in the way that, like we detect moonlight on a full moon night, you know, I mean, like, and when there's, there's not clouds in the sky because the moon is bright relative to everything else. And you get further out of the city and that brightness is more. And like the moonlight happens with half a moon isn't as bright. And so, you know, it's just, if you can take, if you can take that moon signal and then calibrate it to like, okay, this is full moon, this is partial moon. And then you're able to, you know, maybe it needs to be built over time or like the moon, you know, at nine o'clock versus 10 o'clock is going to be a different signal. And you just do something in response to the, where it's calibrated that zero point and mm-hmm. a little bit of movement is all you need. And as long as you say, here's, here's our low and high point, you get something, Good night. Um, you get something from that. So I think it's doable. I think it's just calibration. <laughs> I feel like a, um, yeah. What would we call it like for a design, um, like a very long scope of some kind, telescope or, or zoom mm-hmm. scope or something, really long. And mm-hmm. then you have the the audio be um, in, in headphones that are hooked up to like the, the light sensor inside at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Like. Well, and that that could, I mean, if you have real time sound too, it could help you calibrate it. Right. Yeah. yeah. It could then... also be like a cybernetic system, right? Mm-hmm. 
So like that's why I pictured like you like someone walking in the woods with a backpack, you know, yeah. like almost like the the ghost uh, busters like you know thing, and like yeah. pointing it out and listening like dousing yeah. rod, kind of like finding the moon and and listening to her as they were like, wa- I just think. Or if you haven't listened to anything that's in the sky with yeah. a that's light yeah. source, yeah. and <laughs> that's what you used to calibrate it, that would be just as cool. <laughs> My God! You can you can detect constellations with this thing. <laughs> yeah. that's, like, that's that's kind of a problem we have, right? Is like the 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 light pollution makes it so you can't see the constellations as easy. But if you had like I mean, the the power of some kind of electronics that said you can't see the star system, but I can tell you that like Orion's right here, and that's and then you could you could get like it could be like the sound of Orion, like oh you could have like a like a a tube on your head and then <laughs> you're moving and it's like boop boop <laughs> this is a boop boop <laughs> and you just have this like like moon and stars like head movement and you yeah you need like your own telescope that's amazing yes. just like a little <laughs> dance performance I think we have to make this happen. I know. <laughs> Let's work on it. Uh, yeah. No, no question about that. What are you what are you setting so, up for? So I found this at Goodwill and it's like a, a kind of expensive educational toy, but it was only like <laughs> five bucks. It's called Little Bits, but basically it it's I, it was really good for showing my son how this stuff works a little bit. Cause it's just I mean, I your battery thing is like really easy and like I like lo- love that it's just uh, you know, you, materials you can find, but it's just like it's like magnetic. So you have like here's the battery, you know, here's a switch. So this switch is like a click it. Mm-hmm. This is the LED at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, why is it not sticking? There we go. So you know, when I turn when I click this, it should turn the LED on and off. I don't know if it's yeah. working. It's working. But there's all kinds of different, you know, and there's different paths you could build on, you know, so you could have the trigger be like this sensor that is, um, you know, light. So Mm -hmm. it it detects differences in light. There's one that detects sound so you could clap. You know, there's one instead of the LED turning on, it turns up, spins a fan. Mm -hmm. Um, So you you can basically make these like pathways and you can watch Mm -hmm. how the flow of electricity moves through it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think just like that makes it so for him, it was just like, oh, I can see how this works, you know, how this turns off the switch. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's so it's 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 not microscope microscopic inside of a little case, you know, right, right. You know, once again, the history of, you know, the, the, the computer science museum, like um being able to see you know like here's here's the copper weaving that got us to the moon here's the jacquard loom that isn't a computer but you can see like that's an ibm punch card no doubt about it and that that exposure to like the clear evolution of these things um and just just the physicality of computer science or programmatic aspects, like you, you need to be able to like, oh, here's here's a gate, here's a switch, and then when you deal with the switch in code, you're like, or when you deal with the switch in a tarot deck, right? Like you've inverted this card. Oh. There's. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't I don't use inversions when I read. <laughs> But you understand the concept. Oh, you know? no. That doesn't make total sense. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I mean, this is this is how I teach computer science is like, let's talk about, you know, Python and tarot. And yeah. you know, <laughs> come with me on the journey, young witches who are looking <laughs> for a pop star. <laughs> well, Python was um like the Pythian Oracle. Like Python was uh, a monster that lived where the Oracle used to dwell in the mountain that was killed by Apollo, who is the the god of prophecy. So <laughs> there's your Python. <laughs> yeah. Full circle. <laughs> That's awesome. You know what I was thinking earlier, I uh while I'm before I forget it, um, the neighborhood that you're talking about, would that be a good place to start our free wands? Oh yeah. We want to do a little free wand library. 
my neighbor, my neighbor is like, yes. <laughs> with magic wands. Yes. And let people leave their, you know, their own magic yeah, wands. Yeah, take a wand, leave a wand. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. But I promise you, people will be like, oh, that's that's that must be Maggot. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll have to put on a this is in no way. <laughs> well, you could help us and then it, it would be true. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, because it's like we've got. Isn't there a free library on that end of the block? Yeah, there's a dog stick library. That there's a cool. dog stick library. There's the time machine. There's, I mean, kombucha. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's just you know, it's it's like Halloween for weirdos. Like, just. I didn't know that was where the dog stick library was. Yeah, I've seen a picture of it, and it's fantastic. I, I thought it was like just a meme. <laughs> no, it's 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 two doors down. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's amazing. It's the Kaiju Memorial Stick Library. I've learned. Nice. Um, yeah. No. Yeah, it's, you want. <clears throat> yeah. Please. Please. Yeah. No. Any support. I mean, you can do it in my fr in my grass area if you want. Like, I'm fully. Um, but you know, we'll have to put a like. This is a project of. I'm actually building one, and I just didn't know what to put in. I was going to build a library. And oh, I think we're halfway I'm there. Building. You, oh. Mark, <laughs> yeah, Mark, already building. We, so you were building. I, no, I've been, you know, like deciding what how it's going to be designed, but I just didn't know what to put in it. I didn't want well, books because there's plenty. Of it sounds like you've got carpentry. So. so I just had a, a, an old holly tree cut down, and I'm wondering what to do with all these limbs that are like mid-sized lumber and i was like i should just turn them into a shitload of magic wands yes i that was already the plan so there we go is this kismet <laughs> synchronicity. Synchronicity. synchronicity absolutely amazing yes so. have, we will have our gnomes talk to your gnomes okay okay <laughs> love you. i love it we'll put it on the map of high weirdness <laughs> yeah um kai That's was just brilliant. saying kai uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. I was just saying, Kai, they said that they have a, a dinosaur library in their neighborhood. And I'm wondering what, what what that means. Like, what does that look like? Like little toy dinosaurs, maybe? Little kid dinosaurs? Oh, that would be, that would be cool for toy, like, or maybe, I was thinking maybe just dinosaur books, but. Is it bones? Like what? Well, they live in, oh, I should, I should be clear. They live in Portland, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 say no more yeah. but i'm yeah I'm, I'm dead dead. It. <laughs> <laughs> the earth i like it um so i was asking if the is the map still going yeah mm -hmm. yes it must be because it was wasn't it just still it was liminal seattle back in the day and now yeah. it's yeah, now it's all over the earth. Totally. We just got a submission from Finland. <gasps> yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. First. Yeah, totally. You can see there's um, the dinosaur library. Oh, that is amazingly cool. <laughs> <sighs> I love it. You you had one of the first entries on the map, actually, mm -hmm. I think. From the, do you want to talk about your hedge witch portal? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so full circle. So the on the talk board is the Einstein Rosen Bridge. And um, I don't know which came first. Like, so the so so Equinox is this huge um situation down in Georgetown. It's a bunch of artists, studio spaces and workspaces and galleries and schools. There's like like Gage Academy is down there. It's just like a big art block or two um and then every winter they have like a big um art festival that's it's got like a, a definite burning man vibe like wow. like georgetown burning man um and so a friend of mine um hazel is a metal worker and she every year is like can you do some crazy art installation in the front of the space for the holiday um shenanigans and so that year i was like yeah i want to build <laughs> portals <laughs> to another dimension <laughs> with moss <laughs> and uh i'm like okay so here's how to build a nice day rosen bridge and we just need to open these portals and then we can like shoot through so there were these two like 
you know, like double decker to the ceiling. Like she, like she had a lift. What do you call those things where you drive and like go up? It's like a like mini. A... Oh yeah, I know like what you're talking about. kind of thing. Blue ones? Like the, they're usually it's... blue. Yeah, and it's like it's like accordion or... up. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so these things are hanging from the ceiling in this like warehouse space, and they're like these huge hoops that come down to this little point and then back out to hoops floating above these chalk drawings. And there's just moss everywhere and moss all up these like strings. So it's like this woven moss, Einstein Rosen Bridge portals, two of them. And like I have these friends that live out in the country who like were like, okay, we'll get you the moss. And so they're like moss herders. And so they're like gathering this moss from all over the forest in these like, <laughs> like plastic, like these are people who've worked in the Pike Place market for years. So they're like, we understand how to cultivate like, <laughs> for the harvest. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, we're going to put them in your friend's backyard in Georgetown. And so like, Everyone who lived in that house was like tending the moss. So they'd be out there spraying the moss. <laughs> and then installation day came came and like we're carrying these like plastic, basically they look like body bags of like moss because it was like these long plastic sheets and we'd roll it up and then like be carrying these six foot lengths of moss and plastic bags. <laughs> so we just look like gangsters disposing of bodies. And then like, we're just, so it was just this like immense amount of labor um, with moss, which is, I guess, kind of like my thing now. Um, <laughs> and and so we opened up these portals and I documented it on the map. And like we, we I mean, you want to talk about prophecy and pythons and smoke and seeing things and synchronicity and um, just, I mean, like I don't have words for everything that happened in that space for that event, but um, it was quite a lot and some portals were definitely opened and how it was pretty magical. Yeah, I think there's pictures on the map entry too. If people go, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, I don't. The pictures are like documentation of what we built. So we're, there's, I don't think there's too much of the event, but even those pictures I think are great. Like there's just this, we're building Einstein Rosen bridges with moss and string. Yeah. I, right. I mean, moss. There's like a lot worse things that you could have as your thing than moss. <laughs> Moss is really, really interesting. Yeah. It's so yeah. interesting. Have you read um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's, the, uh, I forget what it was called, Gathering Moss, or I, I don't know. Um, she also wrote uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have that. Yeah. The, 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 the other yeah. one is, is all on moss. It's all about moss and her relationship to it. And, yeah. And how her... <laughs> Okay. culture uses it her indigenous because she's an indigenous author and um yeah it's just it's fascinating and if you ever like if you're watching this holiday season do yourself a favor and get yourself a loop it's a little lens it's a hand lens and you can get them at like art stores um you can get them at like science stores you can order them on amazon um and it's just to carry around in your pocket and like take it out and look at the moss wherever you see it. And it's just like the things that you'll start noticing are mind boggling. Like little flowers. They have flowers. Like little red flowers, a lot of them do. Wow. That's so cool. So yeah, get a loop. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I can I can plug my next thing. Oh please, yeah. Right. Anything you want to plug, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, well, I think it just it dovetails into the whole uh, Hedgewitch Portals crew. Yeah. Um, so we're getting the band back together next June, um, and so the folks um, who who are part of that, in particular, uh, my friend whose public facing name is Sarah Lipstick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to protect her identity um she and i so we're, we're doing a project in june we here's the backstory we wrote a proposal for like the seattle arts commission art and tech you know it was like hey we're gonna give money to artists to work with technology and i'm like i do work with technology we wrote a proposal and they're like no thank you <laughs> but we had such a good time writing this proposal because we're like 
you know, we, we, we'd like got this huge piece of paper and we're like, what are we going to do? And, um, and it was sort of the beginning of me having worked in tech for a long time and really wanting to retell the story of like what technology is. So I was just kind of tired of like a very colonial view <laughs> of electrons. Um, and so we just, and we both, we, we, have been quantum friends. So we met in New York, but we both came from Seattle. We both worked in the market. We were both Avrats. We both, I mean, it was like we had been in all the same spaces and never crossed paths mm -hmm. <laughs> until Brooklyn. And then we both moved back here. Um, and so we wrote this proposal and we sort of did, we, we, we heard the no and then just kind of worked on other things. And I think as I was creating this bog battery, I was like, hey, you know what? I really am pulling from that proposal that we wrote and then stuffed in a drawer and I want to credit you. And then maybe we should look at it again. And we both pulled the proposal back out and 10 years later, it's still like, yes, this is a great idea and we are going to do the project. So sphagnin, which is the name of the, co the, the compound in sphagnum moss, which is what makes things turn black um, is the name of the project. It's sphagnin, uh, ink and logic and it is a series so the center piece of this art project is a big white tent that will start out white and through the use of electrically conductive inks of other mark making materials circuits built with all these sorts of weird contraptions the the tent will slowly be completely engulfed in ink it will change from white to black um and there will be a whole bunch of artworks like these masks and these circuits and all sorts of um, sort of artworks around the logic gates that make up classical uh, computing. Uh, so like Boolean logic. Um, so just sort of like these nitty gritty bits of like early computational and mathematical ideas um, that I think are really interesting because at the top level, they correspond to language. You know, like there's an AND gate and an OR gate and your three-year-old child understands what and and or mean. Like linguistically, those things make sense. We understand on and off. When we get to exclusive nor, that's a little bit fuzzier uh, unless you're dealing with something in computer science. But so taking all of these things, putting them together into this space where mathematical concepts, concepts of witchcraft, concepts of mark making, of ink, of how the world... Um, deals with with decay like all of these things just kind of combine in this piece so it's just this giant storytelling tent surrounded by these objects around all these things that we've been talking about. i probably am not doing it justice because we're so uh, yeah no yeah <laughs> pulling all these things together and telling the story with the bog at the center of like place and time and storytelling and ink and mark making and recording our histories and how we store memory and the bog is a database mm-hmm that is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so when is when are you planning on launching this? Is this gonna uh, the the solstice in June at um it's gonna be it might not be the ex it might be like the Friday after the solstice so maybe the twenty third but uh, around the June solstice or the summer solstice and it's gonna be at Frontier Home which is uh, a local sort of home. Uh, music space because the rent is high. <laughs> so <laughs> my good friend Ian Curry runs this great little performance space in his backyard. Um, and he, you know, he came to the last show where the bog batteries were and he's like, you need to do an art show at this space. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what's happening. But he, and he does amazing stuff. He, uh, Lord Goldston plays there like at least twice a year. Um, great little, you know, banjo bands and um, he had sort of folks from the Southwest who were doing, uh, um, you know, like traditional music. And it, it's just like a great little, here's music I like. And, you know, maybe 20 to 30 people can come. And it's, it's not a public, I mean, it's a public venue, but I mean, it's, it's like, remember when we had bands in the basement, it, you know, I, know. I was wondering about, cause like I'm, I live in Bremerton now and I got old, but, <laughs> uh, and I just like, are people still doing house shows and stuff? Because that when I moved to Seattle, that was what everyone was doing. There's so many mm -hmm. things like that happening. And then it became it seemed to be getting harder to do. So it's it's nice to hear that people are doing that backyard shows and stuff. 
Yeah, I think I think like because Seattle's just so rough as far as space um, that th like, I mean, I have a gallery in my house that's just um, haven't done anything in it since the pandemic, sort of halfway through the pandemic. Um, but I think it's just Is that Chris Gaines CD still on the floor outside. No, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. I came I to your it's... gallery and that was, yeah, there's, there's a Chris Gaines, like the Garth Brooks alter ego CD outside. I was gonna, I was like, yeah. Like I wonder if we need to get another one or maybe there needs to be a Chris Gaines CD library. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> yeah that should be the library. <laughs> The Chris Gaines Memorial. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, other thing is you mentioned Lori Golson. I don't know if everyone, because uh, she's kind of like a Seattle thing. I, oh, oh, yeah. It would be so cool if people knew. She's amazing. Uh, she's a cello player, and mm -hmm. she was actually a cello player on Nirvana Unplugged. Um, and she's also was in Earth, uh, this kind of like slow, I don't know how you, slow metal band. I don't know how you, <laughs> you describe that. Drone metal. Very, what's that? <laughs> drone metal. Drone, drone metal, metal, yeah. <laughs> uh, but she plays like drone metal on cello. It's very slow and, and dark and sad and beautiful. So people should, she's a cool person. I love her. Uh, Lori Goldston, if you haven't heard of her, I recommend it. Big time. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's like the, she's the godmother of metal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I, I regret not know. I didn't know until I met her in Seattle and I was just like, Oh my God, this is so amazing. I have more mm -hmm. people should know her music for sure. But she's, yeah. I mean, she, she plays a lot in town. Like she's, yeah. she's a pretty, I, I like that she's engaged with community, you know, yeah. like, you know, she, she, can, she plays big venue shows and she's like a global rock star, but she's also like, I'll come play your house party. No problem. Totally. You know, <laughs> you should invite her out to Bremerton. You should. Oh, she went. I, I, we've talked about actually having her come play out here. <laughs> yeah. That'd be That's great. Awesome. I'd come out for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this uh, is, um, I just remembered something. Um, I remember what it was that made me think like, oh, I really want to talk to her at some point. <laughs> and that's something we were talking about last week here on the, on um, during WUFA with our friend, Richard Penner, time scanner. Um, I don't know. It's, it's another Seattle friend of ours. And um, he was talking, we were talking about early clues. So early clues was this sort of uh, <laughs> difficult to explain conceptual reality piece that like, Garrett and I and our friend a couple of friends did um, it's like a, it was like a startup that uh, that became sentient yeah. and started opening portals to other dimensions and I, it's <laughs> anyhow <clears throat> we have the <laughs> really clear employee handbook um, which was put out as part of the project uh, wow. available on Amazon and there's like GitHub repositories of code of like yeah. scripting react code to script reality and stuff. Yeah, you would chant the code. You'd use code chant to chant use open QNL coding. Um, because there was even we even made like a fake O'Reilly book with open <laughs> open QNL. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. But one of the things that I did uh, that I was fascinated by at the time, and this was like gosh, when was this even released? Uh, this is 2014, but we had been working on the project for probably three years before this came out because uh, we had a blog. And one of the things that I had done for the blog was to do this. Um, it's called Sync Conjury, and it's like synchronicity conjury. Mm -hmm. uh, and it uses these like electrical diagrams. Oh, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's a speaker like. Yeah. As sigils, as magical sigils. So mm -hmm. you would actually print this out and carry it in your pocket and it would activate what we called your inner ear mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as a speaker. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole thing that goes with it. And I was like, on this whole track of, of like um, uh, electrical diagrams as like magical mm -hmm. symbols and sigils that, you know, could be read by and the, the initiated. <laughs> and then I saw your work and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's, that's fantastic. So um, oh, really glad we were able to to connect tonight for sure. Yeah, I mean, I I think there's that like 
the stacking of realities, right? Like the, a circle is a sigil, is a circuit, is a spell. It's like the, the thing being more versions of itself, you know? So it's like, it's a diagram of a thing, but it's also a thing, yeah. right? Mm. It, it executes this, but it also executes in this like other dimension. So we're, we're moving electrons here, but we're moving energy here and we're moving poetics here and we're moving, you know, and it's, it's like that it's taking away the silo, you know? Interesting. Yeah, totally. It's just like dissolving the silo is the thing. And it's, it, it, it's interesting. Just as you said that I was thinking about how, you know, like right before I got into working with technology, my paint, I was a painter before, doing weird things with electricity and there were there were paintings of electrical circuitry in my paintings and I didn't know what they did I was just attracted to them hmm. so I'm like using them as decorative elements for these paintings but it's almost like I did a spell on myself to like to unlock it or like learn you had to like pull myself into a space where I would know what it meant and how to use it um and so like the circuit was a spell to get me to the circuit <laughs> amazing wow aren't some of your paintings maybe i got this wrong some of them are they conductive or like they like yeah yeah you have like you can clip things to certain they're like they look like paths and they're made of conductive some paint or whatever inks or something or yeah i run for a couple of years there i was just running current through everything so every painting wasn't like it wasn't necessarily meant to be an active circuit all the time but there was a moment of activation. And so I would use conductive inks. Um, pretty much anything burned is conductive, right? Like, so, um, and I learned, <laughs> the way I learned this was working with laser cutters where um, if you, uh, I was I was working in a machine shop where I had to help younger folks, not maybe not younger, but newer to machinery folks <laughs> but along in their journey of working with um, sort of, digital fabrication tools as well as traditional like woodworking and metalworking tools. And somehow there was just like this, this, the fashion of the day <laughs> for the students was to laser cut outlines of things that they were then going to cut on like the bandsaw and the table saw. And I, in like, in my mind, it was like, how did we arrive here? <laughs> um, we did. So they'd like put a piece of wood on the laser cutter, trace out a design, and then go to the wood shop and finish up this design. And um, which is not a great, but you know, like you're learning to make, okay, uh, you're on a journey of discovery. We support that. <laughs> but if you've got a very childproof table saw, the way that you ensure that you don't cut your fingers off is humans are conductive. So if the finger comes into contact with the blade, that circuit is completed, the blade gets locked down and the person in charge of the shop has to replace the blade at not a low cost. And so that's good when you, you're saving a, a person from losing their fingers. It's bad when it's a piece of wood that has this huge char mark from the laser cutter through the middle of it. Oh. So that was a whole, and so that like detonated this thing about the conductive properties of randomly burnt <laughs> and that became a whole journey into conductive ink making because burning things is also where we get a lot of pigment so a lot of my paintings like this one um this is all carbonized rosemary which is a, a plant that i use a lot in my in my practice this is conductive copper tape so this is you know, you can run current through that. Um, it's covered in wax, which is resistive. So these are like all the components of building, you know, a, a circuit. Um, but yeah, so there's all these different ways to work with electricity and materials that are really very organic and very approachable. And I think have a different vibe than like the green plastic. And, you know, I think, I think the, you know, that children's toy that you were showing us, I think is that great middle ground of like, it works, but it's tactile and we like that we're humans mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> we want to we want to touch and feel the thing and not have it be inside of this right yeah actually, i actually have this big chunk of uh a tree that got struck by lightning um on my parents property mm -hmm. 
I'm wondering if there's I could use this for something with that. It has what? the char and it has a it has the lightning char. You know. Do you have a multimeter? Uh, I, don't. I have one. Yeah, you one. just check it out and like if we look at so like this anode and cathode that I've made from copper and zinc, well, you can do the exact same thing with charred wood. You just have to dip one in resin mm. you can get electron flow. So one of the things you can do with that charred wood is you can grind it up. You can use sugar to bind it together, um, burn it out, and you get a nice little mold, right? And then it's what you can do is you can stick like a graphite pencil rod, like the kind that comes you know, that would go in a pencil, but is by itself as like the little top part to hook uh, like wire to. And so you can build these electrodes and or these, you know, anodes and cathodes with that charred wood. And it's, it's got a very different set of like aesthetic properties than metal. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. That sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we have to figure out a way to build something that works as well as the Estes method, but utilizes some of these technologies and, you know, for like, like contacting entities or whatever. Yeah. 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 Whatever this crazy thing we're doing on Wednesdays is. Yeah, do, you, do you know about the Estes method, Megan? Do no, you? no. I, I like, like the, it. <laughs> yeah. like in the scene of things, you know, people were doing this, there's this like technique that where that people really love where basically listening to a spirit box, which is just like a little radio that's flipping through the channels really quickly. Mm -hmm. And they, they're blindfold and they're listening to that. And then some other people in the room are asking questions of that person, you know, to like entities or whatever. And that person is kind of acting as the, I don't know. Receiver. Receiver. Yeah. And so if they hear something, while they're listening to that spirit box, they just say the words out loud. And other people ask questions and the person under can't hear the questions. And sometimes because they're like, it's like blasting into their ears and they, yeah. they can't see anything. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes it matches up. Like you ask yeah. a question and you get an answer. And we do it a lot here, you know, like Bex will go under and people here mm -hmm. will be asking questions. Um, but like, so Jeremy's saying, like, can we do something with all this, these organic things mm -hmm. to like create a technique that gets similar results? Right. I yeah. mean, that's kind of what the fluorophone was an idea about, you know, like mm -hmm. having the plant be that spirit box that people are mm -hmm. listening to mm -hmm. um, and asking questions of the plant. This is the kind of same idea. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's like, I think just what you said, just starting by like making little batteries and like watching this, you know, and then like, you know, building on that, like that's your building block. Maybe we'll, something will come out of this. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the tricky thing with these low voltage batteries is they don't really have any amps. And so when you're dealing with, with signal, that gets a little tricky. Like, you know, can I build an amplifier with this? Um, but what you can do is you can use a relay. So you can have the low voltage, no amp circuit communicating with a higher, maybe not a higher voltage, but like a higher amp circuit. That's, I mean, basically you need, you need constant juice for some of these other sensors, you know, these inputs and outputs to work, but you can have a control mechanism that's coming from these organic low, low, low voltage spaces, just like you're using like electrodes to tap into something, but you're not relying on that plant to give you the electrical current to run something else. But it's giving you some kind of st stimulus, even though it's minor. Yeah. yeah. And then like boost that signal. Mm -hmm. by something else that's has the juice is that what you're saying like yeah yeah um yeah i'm trying i'm like in real time like okay so you yeah. need to wait oh, a like plotting like <laughs> I put the signal amplifier everything yeah. ampl i think like relays and amplifiers are the way you get at pulling you know because just like you were saying um it's like not garrett you're garrett <laughs> <laughs> looking um looking at the moss up close and I think mm -hmm. 
tapping into these like really minute electrical signals and then bringing them up to human scale, just like we talked about the copper, you know, the, the, the core memory taking things like it's almost at human scale. You can see the computer memory in a different way. You know, are there ways we can take these signals that the mycelium network underneath the trees, like that whole network, you know, those electrical signals are super active, but they're also very, very low, you know, so how do we amplify those out? Um, how is, how is something happening with the moon, you know, such an almost undetectable signal, we can see it very clearly because we've got these awesome eyes, but a photoresistor compared to our eyes is, is really different, but maybe it's a whole bunch of them, you know, yeah. so just tapping into these minute signals. Um, I think once you've got that, then like the poetics are just exploding out of everything around us. I know this is so exciting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, well, it is 10 o'clock now, so mm -hmm. this is the time that we go outside if we can to go look at UFOs, look for That's UFOs. Nice. Um, do you want to plug some of your websites and social media or anything like that before? Oh, sure. Um, I was, well, somebody was asking about a syllabus and I'm like, I have a syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Let me pull that well, up real quick. Collective recommended reading list. We should have a more formal one though. Um, someplace because that's a great idea i love when people share the books that they read yeah. <laughs> um i created a syllabus on weaving cybernetics and witchcraft so wait where am i um i'm gonna drop that in the private chat and maybe you can yeah i'll do it that's mm -hmm. um and that that came about because um a professor at NYU had a student who was like, I'd like to do an art project about witchcraft and technology. And he's like, you should talk to Megan Trainer." <laughs> <laughs> and um, she, you know, she just wanted me to pull together some resources for her. And I was like, why don't I share this on Medium in case other people are interested? Um, so it came from like a very specific person's request. But I think it's a good general like, here's where I live as far as... <laughs> um this combination of strange and electrical things um uh, if you want to just the general website is megantrainer.com um and uh i right now i have some info about the last art show i was in safety that was here in seattle um, I've got a zine that you can buy, both uh, digital and print, called Safety Manual, which was from the show called Safety. And it's, again, it's a, it's a combination of explaining all of the artworks I made that were all spells um, and sort of my process, some of the influence, some of the how I approach building things, and then a bunch of NFT memes that I made. And the, for those of you who don't know, I do <laughs> like a six-year-long project called Megan Trainer Witch Memes. And... Um, it's basically me in digital space confronting the problem of sharing a name with a pop star. <laughs> so I make these like really esoteric like memes about like witchy and scientific things. And then I tag myself and then her fans are like, cool. And then they use that hashtag on all the like her the, like people will post about the pop star and use my tag or they'll come and find so it's just this funny moment of exchange between these two communities but i'm always hoping to get like a middle school girl who's like science isn't for girls and she's like and then like seeing these memes and being like wait i'm just about at that age where i'm wearing black eyeliner i'm going to hot topic and i'm getting into tarot cards yeah <laughs> <laughs> And somehow this is all related yeah. to computer science. I'm in. But like that's how we take over. So <laughs> yes, it's it's a bit convoluted. But like so that so I I developed this sort of whole like meme project, and then these NFTs are sort of the very end of that project where I'm now generating um, imagery in Dolly two using AI. And then I'm using a Python script to go take my old memes and sort of recompile them into new, you know, new language. Um, and so it's sort of, I think it's the end of the project, um, but it was just kind of a fun moment to explore NFTs. Um, and then I'm on TikTok as Witch Tech um, because I'm launching a school next summer called Megan Trainer's Witch Tech, where I'm really trying to get middle school girls looking for the pop star to learn Python. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's amazing. Um, and but it's also like a hilarious marketing and brand. I mean, it's like, is it a bad thing? My SEO is great. <laughs> 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 um, and I yeah, and I'm on Mastodon, but I'm not doing too much yet. Um, and then I'll be wherever there's like, I think we should all just like wait for that moment soon where there's some new like space that's just like quiet and beautiful and social and maybe i'm just an anarchist at heart you know like that's why i like pipsqueak <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but i believe it will come <laughs> yeah i hope so cool uh, well uh thanks this for coming is, on. yeah this has been super great i've really enjoyed this and like, so awesome yeah love i'm it. super inspired and people should go definitely go look at megan's website because you can see all her art and it's amazing uh, I mean, you've seen some of it here, but there's more pictures and it's, you're just really, aw you're awesome. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and I, and I, I, and I just feel like we've had this sort of woven conversation through the years of like, yeah. we're so on the same kind of path where it's just like, oh yeah, you're doing it, this thing. Like, you know, it's <laughs> weird how similar there's like little, it's yeah. really weird. Yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> there's a community. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was nice to really, yeah, like sit down and, and kind of see what everyone's really up to and like, you know, get a little bit more about things I've seen online and stuff. Your guys' TikTok is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we've, we're, we're woefully behind on it uh, <laughs> because life is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, all right. I think I'm going to go out and look at the sky. Yeah. yeah. I think I think these this new this new battery that I created needs to be exposed to Wednesday night UFO activity. Yeah, we call it yeah. UFO water into like, moon water. We yeah. charge it with UFO energy. So yeah, yeah. very <laughs> effective for fermentation yeah. <laughs> of all kinds. Well, thanks right. again, Megan, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good woofo, and if you have anything weird happen, let us know. Yeah, definitely. Hashtag WUFO um, or let us know in our Liminal Earth Discord or um, whatever social media site or uh, just project it into the ether. It'll reach us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Good night.